Okay, so in this video, we are going to be solving the so-called two-sum problem in Python. So the problem is we're given a sorted array of integers, we'll call that array A, and we're also given a target value. And we want to determine if it's possible to take two entries of the array A and have them sum together such that they equal the target value. So we're going to assume that each input would have exactly one solution and that you can't use the same element from the array twice. So for instance, you couldn't use two and then two again, you would have to use two distinct elements from this array such that they would add to be equal to the target value. So that's the problem. And we're going to consider three different approaches to solving this problem. And each one will be slightly better from a complexity standpoint. So the first approach that we'll do is kind of the most naive one and it has the worst running time. So this is kind of the brute force approach. And the brute force approach is just to create every single pair of elements that you possibly can from the array A and then check if you sum those two elements from the pair that you generated together, if it's equal to the target. So this is going to be an n squared algorithm. So let's go ahead and code this up because it's pretty easy to code up and then it's pretty easy to also analyze what the time it takes is. So we'll call this two sum brute force and it will take the array A and we'll also take the target value. And what we're gonna do is we're going to have two for loops. So the first for loop is just going to be the outer loop that's going to loop through each of these numbers in the array A. And then the second for loop, the inner for loop is going to go from I plus one all the way to the remaining elements. So for instance, as we start off in the loop, we'll consider the first element of the array A, which will be negative two in this case. And then we want to create the pair by going through the remaining elements in the array and then creating a pair with negative two. So negative two, one, negative two, two, negative two, four, and so on. And then I would progress to the next element in A. We would do the same thing. We would check one, two, one, four, and so on and so forth. And as we create those pairs, we would check whether or not the sum of those elements is equal to the target. And if it is, we return true. Otherwise, we'll, we will have exhausted the possible pairs that you can create. And if the target element is not achieved, then the target element is not able to be achieved in this array. So we're going to go ahead and code that solution up. So we're going to loop through the elements in the array from zero to the length of a minus one. So we're going to say for i in range from length of a minus one. And then the inner loop is going to go to the remaining elements. So we'll say for j in range from i plus one all the way to the length of a. And so inside of this these two loops, what we're going to do is we're going to check if a of i plus a of j is equal to the target. So if a of i plus a of j is equal to the target, then we found the pair of elements that we can form in this array such that they are equal to the target element. So therefore we found it and we can return true. And just for completeness, I suppose, we can print out the elements that we found that sum to the target. So we can print out a of i and we can print out a of j right before we return true. And then otherwise, if we exit out of both of these for loops, we and if we don't trigger this if statement here, which returns, then we will not have found a possible pair. So we'll just return false. So let's go ahead and verify that this approach works. We'll print out two sum brute force of the array A that we've defined above in the target element. So I'll write that and I'll go ahead and give it a run. So we see that the two elements that sum to 13 in this case are the entries two and 11, that's true. So it is able to find that pair and it returns true and that's good. So if we give it something that's not possible to achieve in this list like 20, then we can try that out and we get false. So 20 is not possible to, there's not any way for us to get two elements to sum to 20 in that array A. So let me go back to 13. So let's just do a brief analysis of this algorithm. So since we have these two for loops here, we have a time complexity of O n squared, where n is the size of the array. And then we have a space complexity that's constant. So we're not using any auxiliary data structures to store anything. We're just looping through and checking if the target is equal to the sum of the elements that we form from this pair. And so our space complexity is just a constant. So I'm gonna comment this one out there. So what we're gonna do now is we're going to make a slight improvement on this algorithm and we're going to try to reduce the time complexity from n squared to n. Okay, so another faster approach is one where we can add each element of the array as we process it one by one and we can add it to a hash table. And what we'll do is we'll test whether or not each element that we're processing, whether or not the target minus that element is present in the hash table. So if it is, we know that we've found the element that we're on and also an element that we've encountered before 
such that if we add them together, they will sum to the target value. So in order to understand that a little bit more concretely, let's consider a smaller example than the one that we have above. Let's say a is equal to the numbers 2, 4, and 6, and then our target element is equal to 10. So notice that it's possible to get the target element to 10 by adding the numbers 4 and 6. So what we're going to do is we're going to iterate through the numbers in the array a one by one, and we're going to check whether or not they're present in the hash table. So we start off at 2 which is the first element, and we check whether or not two is in our hash table. Well, we just started off here, our hash table is initialized to nothing, so two is not present in the hash table. So what we do is we store, we say ht of the target minus the value that we're on, so in this case 10 minus two, so that would be ht of h, so I'm, I'm saying ht is the hash table object, Let's, I'll just say ht is equal to a dictionary, so ht of eight, is equal to the value at the first position, so it's equal to two. So we move right along, this is the first, um, let me get rid of that nine, it's the first index of our loop. So we continue on in our loop, i is equal to one, we're processing the element now stored at the first position in this array, which is four, and then basically we check whether or not four is present in the dictionary. So we look, we have eight, but we don't have a four. So what we do is we do the same procedure that we did before, we say h of t, 10 minus 4, so in that case that's going to give us 6, and that's going to be equal to the value stored at the first position, which in this case is 4. So we're going to move along in the array, now we're processing the last element here, the second element, and what we're going to do is we're going to check whether or not this is present in our hash table. So we go through our hash table, we check, 8, no it's not 8, 6, we do have a 6, and so what we do is we return the value here for the entry six. So we know that if we add the value that we were processing, which was six, with the value that was stored at this entry for six, four, that will sum to the target value. So that will sum to 10. So that's gonna be the general approach for this hash table approach. Let me just get rid of this here. So let's go ahead and code up a function which we'll call to sum hash table. Again, it will take array A and a target. And what we're gonna do is we're going to define our hash table object first as a Python dictionary, and then we're going to loop through the elements in A. So we're gonna say for i and range length of A. What we're gonna do is we're going to ask if A of i is present in the dictionary. So if it's present in the hash table, we found our match. So what we can do is we can, just like we did up above, we can print out the pairs that match here. So this would be a of i, uh, this would be, sorry, a, ht, the hash table entry of element a of i and a of i. So we can print out those two as those two would be the numbers that correspond to the numbers that sum to the target, and then we can return true. Otherwise, if we don't, uh, if we don't have the condition that a of i is in the hash table, we'll do what we did in the example. That is, we'll take the entry at target minus a of i, to be equal to a of i. So we'll do this if the element is not present in the hash table. So if we go through this for loop and we don't ever hit this return true statement, we know that we don't have the, the possible pair in the, in the array a that gives us the target value that we're after. So we're gonna return false if we go through the loop and don't hit this true statement. So let's go ahead and verify that this actually works as expected. So we'll print out to sum hash table and we'll feed it the array A and the target element. We'll write that and then we'll give it a run. So again, we have our array up here as we did before, and then the target element is 13. So we know that two and 11 would sum to be 13. So we'll run that, and indeed we get the pair two and 11, true because this pair exists. So that's pretty much that. A very quick analysis of this algorithm. We know that we have a time complexity now that's cut in half, so a time complexity which is just order n, because we're only looping through the array one time, so that's just in this for loop here. But the space complexity, so the space complexity, is also linear, because we're storing this dictionary object here, and basically as we proceed through, in the worst case, we might have to store an entry at every single element that's proportional to the size of the array. So that is not quite ideal. So the final solution that we'll consider in this video is one that takes a linear amount of time and also a constant amount of space. So let's go ahead and just write up this function. I'm gonna comment this out here. We'll write up a function that says just to sum. It will also take the array A and the target element. The way we're gonna approach this final to sum is to take advantage of the fact that these elements in this array are sorted.
So the general approach for this last idea is we're going to have two iterators. We'll call them i and j. So i will start at the front of the array. So it'll start at the first element here. And j will start at the final element of the array. And then what we'll do is we'll check whether or not the sum of the first and last element is equal to the target. So in this case, we have 11 plus minus 2, which is 9. So in this case, the sum that we achieved there is less than the target. So notice if we move i up, since the array is sorted, that's going to increase that sum. Likewise, if we were here, if that was the opposite, if we wanted to decrease that sum to get closer to the target, we would move j towards the front of the list. So since 11 plus minus 2 is 9, we want to increase that to see if we can get to 13. So what we'll do is we'll increment i by 1. And so now i is here and j is still at 11. So what we do is we add 11 and 1. And then we see that that is 12. So that's still less than the target value. So again, we progress i by 1 to 2. And then we add the, the elements at i and j respectively. So in this case, we get 11 plus 2, which is equal to the target element, which is 13. And then therefore, we just exit out of the loop and we return true because 2 plus 11 gives us 13. So that's going to give us no extra space and also a linear amount of time to process. So let's go ahead and code that up. So what we'll do is we'll have two iterators as we described. i is equal to 0 starting from the front of the list and j is equal to the length of a minus 1. And then what we'll do is we'll say, well, i is less than or equal to j. We'll kind of pincer these in together based on whether or not it's less than or greater than the target element. So we'll ask if a of i plus a of j, if this is equal to the target element, then we found we found the pair of elements that sum to give us the target. So in this case, we can print out a of i and a of j, and then we can return true. So otherwise, we'll do this increment i or decrement j. So what we'll do is we'll check else if, if a of i plus a of j, if this is strictly less than the target. So again, this is what we had here. So we, we started off at the at i is equal to 0, and then j is at the end of this list here. So we sum those together, we got 9. So in this case, a of i plus a of j is less than the target. So what we want to do is we want to move i. We want to increment i by 1. If it was the opposite, if it was the other direction, we'd want to decrement j by 1 to move this guy down here. So in this case, if a of i plus a of j is strictly less than the target, what we're going to do is we're going to increment i by 1. And then else, so just, I guess, as a comment here, this is the case where we have a of i plus a of j is strictly less than the target. So in this else condition, what we'll do is we'll decrement j by 1. So if we go through this entire while loop without hitting this true statement, what we can do is we can return false because the pair in that array doesn't exist to give the target element that we were after. So let's go ahead and verify that this works as well. So we'll copy this statement, and then we'll just get rid of this part of it here. So let's go ahead and verify that this actually gives us the correct answer. So again, we get also 2 and 11, just like we did for the other two implementations, and true since the pair exists in this list. So I'm also just going to write a comment up here just to be complete with the other functions that the time complexity here, this is O of n, again, where n is the size of the array that we're given, and then the space complexity is constant because we're not using any auxiliary data structures to store anything as we were when we use this hash table approach. So that pretty much does it for this video. If you have any questions or comments, please don't hesitate to leave them in the description below or in the comment section below. I'll host this code on my GitHub page and that link will be in the description. Thanks again for watching and have a great day.